All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Luis De Rose, I'm the chair for this session today. And the first speaker is, is a pleasure to introduce you, Katie Antipas. Uh, Katie is a distinguished SC23 panelist, and she's currently at NSF, uh, where she she's the director of the National National Science Foundation Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, uh, where she oversees the development and deployment of advanced computing, data networking research resource uh, for research and education community. So Katie has been in HPC for quite some time. Uh, she, uh, most of her career, she has been uh, at NERSC, uh, the National Energy Research Scientific Computing, at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And over there, she has had several different positions, uh, such as Deputy Director, Division Director, Project, Project Director, Director of Hardware and Integration for the Exascale Computing Project, Data Department Head, and User Service Group Leads. So she has an MS in computer science from the University of Chicago and a bachelor degree from, in physics from Wesley College. So please uh, welcome Katie. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So what I'd like to do today is talk to you about the pilot that we are launching for the National AI Research Resource, also known as the NAIR. And so what I'm gonna do is start with a discussion and background of the NAIR, what I'm gonna refer to as the full NAIR, and then I'll move into talking more specifically about our plans to launch the NAIR pilot. So what is the vision for the NAIR? The vision is a widely accessible national research infrastructure that will advance and accelerate the US AI R&D ecosystem. And it will empower a diverse set of users by providing them access to the computing, the data resources, the data sets, models, training, user support, uh, resources in order for them to participate in the AI innovation ecosystem. And so as I've been talking with members of the community about the NAIR and the NAIR pilot, I am sometimes asked, not often, but I have been asked, well, why, why do we need a NAIR? Uh, we have big systems and resources, don't we? And so clearly, we have um, massive systems and resources many of which are on display here at Supercomputing 2023. But it is also clear that um, in order to even participate in the AI research ecosystem, you have to have access to the data and computing resources. And those requirements are growing. Those requirements are growing, and they are increasingly concentrated in our largest technology firms and the most well-resourced uh, companies, universities, institutes, and laboratories. And so those resources that are required are, remain inaccessible to broad communities across our country that have the ability to participate in this ecosystem. And furthermore, it is critical, particularly at this stage in time, that the researchers that are investigating AI and using AI for key societal challenges, whether it's our changing environment or in researching human health or the security and stability of our infrastructure, that these researchers, these researchers that are investigating and using AI for the public good, for the public interest, that they have access to the resources that they need. And so, not only for their own research, but to train the next generation of researchers. And so the NAIR is intended to bridge that gap. The NAIR is intended to strengthen and democratize the US AI innovation ecosystem in a manner that protects 
privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. And so there are four key goals that were articulated as part of the vision for the NAIR. One is to spur innovation, to increase the diversity of talent in AI, to improve US capacity for AI R&D, and then to advance trustworthy AI, which is also uh, in, known as responsible AI or AI safety. So it's worth pausing here for a second to say, how, how did we get here? Uh, how did we get here? This all started with um, the 2020 National AI Initiative Act, which mandated the creation of the NAIR Task Force. The NAIR Task Force was charged with examining the feasibility of this concept of the NAIR. So this task force met for uh, over a course of 18 months and deliberated, and they published a final report in January of this year, January of 2023. They provided a roadmap for the NAIR, including um, an optional pilot. So then in March of this year, an interagency working group was formed led by OSTP, Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as NSF, um, along with 14 other different agencies. Um, and a, a few of those agencies are, are, are here to, uh, at, at the SC conference, and those are the National Institutes of Health, NIH, NOAA, NASA, and the Department of Energy. And so we've been collaborating uh, to plan for the launch of this pilot. Then, uh, just two weeks ago, the President's Executive Order on Trustworthy AI directed NSF and collaborating agencies to launch a NAIR pilot within 90 days. So I'm gonna pause here for a moment because what I've described so far is the vision for the NAIR, what I'll call the full NAIR. And if you read this report and there's been uh, past talks and uh, panels about the NAIR concept and this full NAIR. The NAIR is envisioned to be a large program. The report articulates it to be a, a program, a $2.6 billion program um, over six years. There's a formal governance structure and an independent non-governmental operating entity that is competed uh, to operate it. What I wanna move to now is talking about the pilot, okay? And so the pilot, where we are today, is that we want this pilot to demonstrate or investigate all the major elements that are envisioned in the NAIR, but at a limited scale, okay? And so this is the best effort, proof of concept effort that we are engaging in now. And so what we are doing is we are leveraging agency-supported resources, that's the resources that we have in hand today, and in-kind contributions from industry and nonprofit. The key goals of the NAIR pilot are to demonstrate the value and the impact of the NAIR concept, not only to our federal stakeholders, but also to the AI R&D community. This needs to be something that they want to, to use and see value in. We wanna support novel AI research and get broad participation from the education community as well. And then finally, we need to gain experience, uh, investigate some of these challenging areas to help us in the design of a future full NAIR. So in terms of a, a short-term roadmap here, the executive order is driving our, our timeline. So this executive order that was released August 30th, as I no noted, says that within 90 days, we will launch this uh, pilot that means that we will launch the pilot in January of, of next year. In the meantime, we have been meeting with uh, potential industry and um, agency and nonprofit pot potential resource providers to understand what they would like to contribute and how they might want to contribute to the pilot. We are um, in, in those conversations now. Uh, and then later in the spring, we'd expect uh, a more full launch of, um, of the pilot with uh, more integrated operations. And so we'd anticipate that this pilot would last approximately um, two years and over time would evolve to include a tighter governance structure alloc with alloc allocations and, um, as we go forward. Last week, we had the first uh, convening of the NAIR pilot 
This was held at NSF headquarters uh, outside of DC. We had 100 different participants from different agency resource providers as well as industry and nonprofits. And it was, a great, it was a great discussion. We got some fantastic feedback that is already helping to um, inform some of our decisions going forward. This is the first in what will be many in a series of out, outreach activities that I will highlight uh, further in this talk. The users that we anticipate and that we want to support as part of the NAIR pilot include AI researchers, okay, domain scientists applying AI, as well as students and educators. And we really want to articulate that these three different categories are all crucially important to the success of the pilot. Uh, these uh, researchers or educators um, can come from US-based institutions and that are listed there on the right, including um, universities, uh, laboratories, state and local governments, or startups that have um, grants with small businesses. So I, I should note that I think we are very well aware that these communities may have different requirements. And, but the pilot is intended to support both uh, beginners and reach out to those who are just starting their career investigating and using AI in their research, as well as more advanced researchers. I think that's one of the challenges of the pilot, but it's one I think that that we will uh, that we will be able to 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 handle moving moving forward. I think this will be exciting. So together with our interagency partners and OSTP, we have created uh, and developed a number of different science thrusts for the NAIR pilot. The domain-specific thrusts are list listed there on the left, and some of the cross-cutting thrusts are on the right. So these domain-specific thrusts include um, a focus on AI safety, reliability, security, and privacy. Clearly, that was highlighted in the recent executive order that was uh, released. There's also science thrusts around human health, uh, public infrastructure, environment, and um, manufacturing. In terms of some of the cross-cutting thrusts, uh, we want the, to have the pilot, uh, we want to investigate um, using more secure data sets and what are some of the challenges around, uh, around that. We want to investigate or enable using large-scale models to explore complex data sets interactively, and also really focus on training the next cohort of scholars to, to use AI. So in terms of the pilot architecture, what are we envisioning here? This, the vision for the architecture is quite similar to what is articulated in the NAIR task force report. There's a set of pilot users that will access a set of, of resources um, through a, a central portal, okay? These resources can include on-site resources from agencies, cloud computing resources, data sets, models, but also training, user support, um, and uh, at, uh, training and user support. What we are really emphasizing in this pilot is the crucial importance of a community design process. We know this field is moving incredibly fast, and so we are really asking for the community's input as we go forward and design this pilot. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the governance structure next. I also wanted to note that sometimes is, uh, we've had a few questions about this, that the pilot is intended to provide the infrastructure for researchers to access, right? The pilot is, will not fund individual end user research. So users will bring their research project uh, and be able to access um, the pilot resources. In terms of the governance structure, here's how we plan to organize the pilot. And this is intended to allow us to move quickly and to investigate a number of these different, um, different thrust areas. So we currently will have a steering committee. This is made up of representatives from the government agencies that are contributing resources. Then we have already formed a pilot program management office. This is coordinated by NSF and includes representatives um, 
from other agencies as well. Then we have divided the technical work into four tentpole thrusts, which I'll go into more in detail here. They are near open, near secure, near software, and near classroom. And these tentpoles will form the, and drive the technical work forward, and those leads will form um, a, a technical committee. We also have an executive committee and that will provide strategic input on the directions of the pilot. And this will be made up of industry or agency providers that are providing significant leadership and uh, crucial resources to the pilot. And then finally, we, uh, and we will be standing up a number of different advisory groups. There's four that are listed here and these were articulated in the, the full NAIR task force report. These are the, an ethics committee, a science advisory committee, technology uh, advisory committee, and a user committee as well. Okay. In terms of the tentpole thrusts, I wanna walk through some of these in a little bit more detail. For NAIR open, well, this will enable open AI research uh, and access to that diverse set of resources that I articulated through a central portal and coordinated allocations. The NAIR secure tentpole is going to be led by the Department of Energy and NIH, and um, the, the purpose of this tentpole thrust is going to be to investigate the challenges around using more secure data sets that require additional privacy and security preserving methods, and the, they plan to assemble um, a number of these uh, um, data sets and try to understand what are the, uh, the key design patterns that would enable and design a future NAIR. For NAIR software, we want to enable this pilot uh, or this tentpole thrust to take a step back and really look and survey all the many AI uh, libraries and software and platform tools that are available and begin to think about uh, what it might mean to start developing a NAIR software stack. I've also heard maybe it's a NAIR ecosystem uh, uh, stack here. And we can imagine that in, down the road, this would be incredibly useful to have a NAIR software stack that then different university campuses can use to plug into a future NAIR. And then finally, the last tentpole thrust is NAIR classroom. And this is intended to be uh, partnering with universities to provide the AI research uh, resources that are needed to support the education community, to be able to reach new communities as, as well. And, uh, it, it, you know, when I have been talking with different members in the community, including a, uh, a pref professor in, in, in at Tennessee, she said, you know, I can't even give the homework assignments that that I want to give in my class because our students don't have the resources. And so it is not in the NAIR pilot scope to be developing the AI curricula for classrooms, but it is in the NAIR pilot scope to be providing the uh, infrastructure that those classrooms may use. So in terms of an early user program, we anticipate that users are going to be enabled through the pilot in two different tracks. One will be an agency track for identified uh, high priority agency priority workloads. And then there'll be an open track, an open call for proposals, which will include reviewed research requests as well as startup allocations. In the open track, this will be inspired by the successful HPC COVID-19 consortium. If, if you haven't heard of this, this was a co consortium that ran um, a couple years ago that brought together uh, agency resource providers as well as private industry to address and enable research for the COVID-19 pandemic. It was stood up very quickly, and we want to take and learn, uh, take those lessons learned from that consortium as we um, develop the NAIR pilot. Also note that the size and the scope of this early user program will really depend on the contributions that uh, we, we receive from industry and, and nonprofits. I say this because we, uh, in the government, we're aware of the resources that are coming online. So for example, within the NSF, we have a new system coming online 
uh, in March, another one in, in this summer. And so we can plan the, and, and scale the pilot in, in those situations. Uh, but we are welcoming contributions from uh, industry and nonprofits to contribute to this pilot, which I'll talk about here more in a minute. I want to pause for a moment and, and talk about um, the key challenges and our plans for addressing uh, the data requirements that are needed throughout this uh, pilot. And so clearly, having access to high quality da data sets, the data pipelines, the networking, and the infrastructure is going to be absolutely critical. In this pilot stage, in this proof of concept stage, we are identifying with our agency partners key data sets that could be made more broadly available in the NAIR pilot. And then we will also be expecting that uh, the initial use cases from the open call will drive the data sets that are incorporated into the NAIR pilot. So we expect this to be very uh, user driven as we go forward. Transparent and responsible AI will also be a key focus of the pilot. And so the first of those four advisory committees that we want to stand up is the Ethics Advisory Committee. I think this is crucial to ensure that, um, that ethical AI is incorporated at all levels of the pilot. And so this will, we want to get advice from this advisory committee on how we should include um, trustworthy AI, ethical AI in the evaluation of proposals and standards for those uh, contributing to the pilot how we do training and outreach, as well as our operational policies. And so we are going to be collaborating very closely with NIST uh, on a guidance and best practices in the AI executive order. NIST has a, a big role in creating those, those standards and ensuring um, uh, trustworthy and responsible AI. Uh, user feedback is also going to be critical to the pilot's design. And so this first set of early users will form our, our first user group. And I think this is going to be a fantastic opportunity to collaborate across uh, agencies to seed some of those collaborations. I mean, we know that science does not fall cleanly along uh, agency funding boundaries. And so I think, I think this is something I'm, I'm really excited about and looking forward to. Certainly as part of the Exascale computing project that I, I had the opportunity to be part of um, in the last few years, it was just am amazing to be able to bring together researchers from very diverse domains and, um, uh, and see those new ideas seeded and best practices shared, shared widely. And that's certainly something I'm hoping we can do in the, the pilot as well. So we are under no illusion that this is going to be easy, okay? We think it's gonna be hard, and that's really why we want a pilot. I think that's why we need a pilot, so that we can start uh, addressing some of these challenges really early. We know democratizing access is not easy. We know reaching new communities is hard. Onboarding new users is hard. Uh, we know that there are many, many challenges with moving and managing data sets, getting the data to the, comp to the computing resources. Um, we know that interoperating between different um, uh, types of systems is charred. These are all challenging. We, we don't know how to set up a system yet in a research environment that will ensure responsible and trustworthy AI. That's what we need to work on together as as a community. And so I think if we start this early and we get a good jump start, we'll be able to really inform a future design of a full NAIR. So what is our, our immediate and, and uh, plan here? So January is just around the corner, right? With two holidays in between. And so our initial launch in January, it's going to be with the resources that we have in hand, as well as um, some new partnerships that are already spinning up. We intend to release a call for user interest here very shortly as well. Then as we move towards the spring, we will be opening, a, have an open call 
for NAIR pilot users on some of those targeted areas that were identified in the science and research thrust. We'll have made progress standing up some of the governance structures and the executive committees, and we'll have a, um, a portal with back-end operations moving. And then as we move into the summer, we'll have a more mature early user program, more fully featured portal and user support operations, and hopefully some initial lessons learned from, from the tent pole thrusts. So as I, as I say, the, the NAIR pilot train is moving. We are getting out of the station here. Our first stop is going to be in January. In January, there will be limited service and limited riders, but we are going to build steam from there. There's a number of ways that you can get, a, get aboard the NAIR pilot uh, train here. And um, one of those, if you are a resource provider, is that we would love to talk with you about some opportunities for collaboration. We are certainly seeking computing and data uh, resources for sure. Uh, I think our, our research community is hungry for that, absolutely. But we're also seeking partnerships um, around the, the software stack, user support and training, data sets that you may have access to or models. And more than anything, we're seeking your collaborations, your feedback and your expertise. And so we would love to talk with you about um, potential contributions to the NAIR pilot. If you are interested in being part of that initial launch in January or further down the road as well. And you can send any of those questions to this address here, nairpilot at nsf.gov. We have about uh, four people that are sort of uh, reading and accessing it. So it's not a large team, but we will definitely get, get back to you. We already have a couple um, contributions and partnerships that are starting to move forward. The first um, came from the, the Allen Institute for AI, AI2. And they are incredibly excited about this partnership with the NAIR pilot. And they are going to be providing facilitated access to data sets, uh, large scale models, and training as part of their open AIs, uh, or sorry, excuse me, um, AI2's open ecosystem. This includes the um, DOLMA uh, corpus, as well as their OLOMO um, large language model that will be released in the next year and they'll also be providing technical expertise in helping us design the pilot. More recently, we'll be also be partnering with Eleuther AI. We have a, a, a press release coming, but I'll say here that um, they'll be providing a significant number of GPU hours and access to, and support for their large language model um, training libraries, which um, some of them are actually already installed on, at the systems at Oak Ridge National Lab and they have committed to providing uh, their expertise in getting these libraries on other supercomputing systems uh, as well. We have a number of different outreach and community engagement activities that are coming up. Your engagement here is critical and crucial for the design of the pilot. So as I mentioned, we'll be having this call for research interest that will be coming out said soon, I don't think it's going to be November based on what, what else is happening the rest of November, but, but it should come out in December. And our objective here is really to understand the breadth and diversity of, of use cases for, for the NAIR pilot. Uh, this will formally come out as an RFI, but I'm calling it a lightweight survey because we, uh, we want many students to fill it out, and I don't know many students who fill out RFIs. So we're going with a lightweight survey. I think you can help us by, by sharing and broadcasting this to your community. We'd love to show a groundswell of support and demand for the NAIR uh, pilot as, as we move forward. We'll also be having um, a couple meetings. The dates have yet to be set. I've put them as winter. The first is a meeting on responsible and trustworthy AI. As I mentioned, the ethics advisory group is the first uh, advisory group we want to stand up as part of the NAIR pilot. And so we will bring together leaders, that, uh, leaders in this field that can um, discuss how the NAIR pilot can enable trustworthy and responsible AI. We also anticipate um, there will be a NAIR software staff workshop in um, 
in, in the winter as well. And again, this is just to begin the discussions on how uh, we may pull together a NAIR software stack and understanding the diversity of software options that are, that are available. There'll be a number of other outreach activities as well. And again, you are welcome to send us um, questions to NAIR uh, underscore pilot at nsf.gov. And then finally, uh, tomorrow at 12.15, we are going to be having a boff on the NAIR pilot. And we will, you'll be able to hear from different agencies that are here and their perspectives, what they plan to contribute to the NAIR, what they are, want to get out of the NAIR uh, as well. So we hope you'll be able to join us. That's at the 12.15 lunchtime slot in room 401 and 402. So with that, I think um, there is actually plenty of time for, for questions. And so I'm happy to, to take your, to your questions now about the, the NAIR pilot. All right, so what we're going to do is uh, we also have the, the uh, questions from the, the virtual. So, uh, in fact, let me start with the questions from the virtual. Uh, how big should NAIR be and how can it scale up in size as demand goes? Okay, great. Um, so, the NAIR is envisioned, the, NAIR, the full NAIR is envisioned, as I mentioned, to be this large scale program, right? And it is articulated to be a, a $2 billion, $2.6 billion um, initiative over, over six years. Where we are right now is really bootstrapping this effort, this in kind, um, this, and, and using in kind resources to launch the pilot here. I, I think what would, and we have amazing momentum with the AI executive order. I think what we can do together is show a, a real demand for this capability. I mean, clearly, to really scale the pilot larger is going to require appropriations and, and um, for Congress to, to act for that. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Okay, so we have... Hi, Beth Lilly, Indiana University. Thank you for this. Um, is there effort on the agency part to enable their data sets specifically for AI use, or is that something they are counting on the community to do? So the pilot will make, uh, will make data sets available and can support um, the, infra you know, the infrastructure to make those available. The actual, if it needs domain-specific you know, expertise, that would require um, you know, funding from the different, say, directorate within NSF. But part of the pilot will, um, we can investigate with certain data sets, right, certain early, early use cases, how to make those data sets more available uh, and AI ready for the community. And, and I'm sorry, and thank you. And that's driven basically by, by, by researcher, educator demands. Is that what I heard? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So another one uh, from Virtual. Do you think standards will help the system and its users? Do we think standards will help the system and users? You know, I, I, I absolutely do anticipate that standards will, will help the community. I think what we want is that the community comes together on what those um, standards may, may look like. And I think in the pilot, that's what we can, that's what we can explore. I mean, certainly there's so many different software stacks that for there to be, you know, a near software stack, at some point we'll have to settle on, um, we'll have to settle on, on something. Maybe it's an interoperable set of, uh, of resources. But, but certainly I think that uh, is, will be part of the pilot um, investigations. Cool. Yeah, John. Hi, uh, John Towns, uh, NCSA at University of Illinois. Thanks for the presentation, Katie. Um, 
as I was watching your slides and listening to you talk, what I didn't quite understand is how will potential resource providers actually hook into this uh, ecosystem? Um, I didn't see how they might be represented in some way in governance, and I didn't understand from the, the boxes that were lined out who are they working with actually to, to integrate their resources into the environment, or maybe that's a question for the pilot, I don't know, but I didn't know if you have any thoughts on that at this yeah, point. Yeah, so the, um, we, we wanna stand up an executive committee of the uh, leadership for resource provider leadership but in terms of the technical committee that is sort of standing in for an operating entity that doesn't you know, exist at, at, at this stage, we would anticipate that technical committee would include resource providers, absolutely. Resource providers from industry as well as agencies. Thanks. All right, so, um, wow, no, a lot of here. So let me, in order from um, with such a potential diverse set of stakeholders how are you working to a shared vision of understanding to ensure sufficient succinct communication was, repeat with such a potential diverse set of stakeholders how are you working to a shared vision of understanding to ensure sufficient, succinct communication. Succinct communication, right. So I, I think you know, we'll be setting up a more formal governance structure and um, also a communication plan. So I mean, we clearly are gonna be getting a, a website up. People have already been asking if they can join a, a NAIR uh, mailing list. So those are certain things that we can, uh, we can certainly look at, at doing. We also just really wanna be out there in the community and leverage a number of the existing programs that we have to reach really broad and diverse communities that really are not part of our ecosystem right now. And so we will rely on those, um, those networks that we have through universities and different agencies to, to reach those communities. Yes. Hi, CS Chang, P Princeton Plaza Physics Lab. Long time no see, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> nice talk. Uh, just a simple question. How are you gonna have uh, all the data open up f for this system? Even in uh, magnetic fusion program, even in the US, uh, opening up the, the data from each facilities completely is a, is a questionable <laughs> task. So you're gonna aim at uh, say publicly owned data first, like health data, such data first? Right, so we're gonna start with you know, particular data sets that can be made open. Of course, the NAIR, the NAIR secure temple thrust is also gonna be looking at um, more pr protected data. And I mean, I think we're gonna have to work with those uh, you know, owners of, of the data to see how it can be made open if that is so, so desired. I mean, right now we have some use cases from um, NIH and NASA where we can, uh, we want to open up the data sets or we want to envision or allow users from different communities to access those data sets. And so I think we will start there. I absolutely recognize the challenge when you're at these large centers. These large centers require uh, in order to access the compute and data, you have to get an account, right? And, and that can make your, uh, your data part of like a, a citadel, and if someone leaves, it's very hard to get access. I think that's actually something our community to get, needs to, to think and, and work on, is how can we provide access to the data that, that is, can be separate from, from the com compute? And of course, there, I know there's many collaborations and initiatives in, in that in that area. But for the pilot, we're gonna start with the, the use cases that we've identified at, with agencies that, that can be made open and where there's a demand for cross collaborations across uh, agencies. Okay, thanks Katie. All right, um, next one. Are there analogous efforts in other countries to encourage AI research? Is there any possibility of international collaboration? Yeah, great question. Um, so. 
clearly we're starting here with US-based uh, researchers, and that is our directive and our, and, our, and our mandate. But just as with the COVID-19 consortium, what started as a US-based initiative, um, you know, we, en we enabled international collaborations as well. And so we have been wor working and starting conversations with some uh, agencies that are more focused internationally on how we might share best practices or lessons learned from the NAIR pilot. Uh, I, I do think some other, other countries in Europe are, are looking at some similar, uh, similar initiatives, and I think we absolutely want to uh, understand the directions they're going, share best practices and pitfalls as we, as we go forward. Cool. Um, another one here. Uh, how do you plan to train the required talents to execute this program? Uh, I, the technical support will require experienced engineers, and how does the government plan to attract talent in AI, given industries coping most of it? Sorry. So, <laughs> I, I think all of us here are aware that you can yeah. give you can give someone a access to a system, a GPU, a data set, but if you don't have the expertise and the know-how to use it, then then you haven't made any progress at all, right? And so a key element for the NAIR pilot will be reaching those broad communities and the developing programs um, and supporting universities that need these resources to teach and train the next generation. And so we'll, in, in, within NSF, we'll certainly be partnering with other, other directorates uh, uh, in that area. Okay. Okay, nice to see you, Katie, here. So great talk, thank you very much. So I have one question here. So for the pilot stage, does any money from NSF goes into this program? My, my concern is that it's like you are asking people kind of contribute to the time to work on this project and then also asking computing centers or whoever has a cloud provider or whoever relevant, they contribute computing time. Then my question is, um, then how you can, I mean, for each individual who needs to work on this, how they can justify the time spent on this project. So I thought there are money support should go there. That's one thing, and the other one is why computing centers like NERSC would like to contribute hours to this project. Right, okay, great, great question. So I think you can justify um, your time on the project. Uh, you can look to the AI executive order that directs us to do this. And so it is directing us to do this with the resources that we have in hand. And so that is, uh, um, we are following that uh, presidential executive order. We, in, as NSF, in our FY24 budget request, which is you know, publicly available, um, there is a request for $30 million for the NAIR pilot. I mean, that is, is not enough for large-scale computing, but that is enough to build and uh, aid some of the, the cartilage that is, that is needed to deploy, deploy the pilot. As far as nurse con contributing, I think you've got to talk to uh, Ben Brown, who I think is somewhere in this, this audience here, and, and work with DOE on, on, um, on, on their plans here. But uh, I think we have so much momentum right now with the executive order and all the attention that has been going t to the NAIR that I, our opportunity here, our opportunity is really to demonstrate this value, right? The value and the impact of the NAIR to the broader community. Clearly a larger NAIR is gonna take a congressional act and appropriations. But what we can do here as a community is show that we're ready and that there is a, a real need for the community for this type of investment. Okay. Thank you. So let's take the last question from the audience and then we have a certificate to give to you. So, uh, <coughs> Excuse question. Me, my name is Dennis Gannon. I have a question about uh, the way the uh, pilots will access data versus models. I have a sense that, <coughs> my experience is that the access data 
from really sensitive places with very carefully curated data collections is actually harder than accessing trained models uh, from organizations like Hugging Faces who've been doing a great job on this. Do you sense that, especially on the education side, it may be easier for people to access models? Or is there a sense, people know people just want data? That's the question. Okay, so I mean, I think what we want to do with the, with the NAIR pilot and the portal is make sure that these uh, data sets that people need for their research or for their ed educational purposes are available. You know, the, the, um, we don't anticipate the NAIR pilot standing up you know, data libraries will be uh, making those data sets av available to the community. I do think what you brought up is the data is the key challenge here. Uh, data is, the, is, our, is our major challenge, um, I think, in HPC as, as well, and it certainly is in, in AI. Um, I think what the educators want to, want to do uh, will be up to individual classrooms. I think you're right, it's probably easier to get access to an open source model, but the data will be the real challenge. I think we can facilitate that by you know, making sure that, that key data sets are accessible. All right, so let's thank the speaker again. And we have uh, <laughs> certificates. Oh, great. Let's go in the middle. Oh, go in the middle, okay. No. Yeah. There we go. Oh, should I shake hands? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.